McCarthy pulls it back. O'Connor hits one. It's a storming return to the first team for Martin O'Connor. Hello and welcome to the Blues Focus podcast with me, your host, John Graham. Thank you so much for taking the time to download this pod. And as, as of recent weeks, we've got yet another unbelievable special guest uh, to sort of run through a very distinguished career at, at, at Blues. With me on the call is, is Tom, as ever. Tom, you all right? Yeah, good. Thank you, mate. You? Yeah, very good, mate. Very good. And, and a man that needs absolutely no introductions at all to all the faithful out there. Um, we'll talk about a very, very famous day that he capped in the club a little bit later on in the pod. But for now, Martin O'Connor, how are you? And thank you for joining us. I'm very well, thank you, John. I think um, we're all oh, feeling wait, that, I'm mate, okay. to be honest. This top's a bit spray on now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, Martin, what, what I'd like to do is maybe just go back to, to the very beginning, because I think it's good that I think the Blues fans don't just understand that the man that played for the team, but the journey getting there. And I, I guess what you're doing now and your thoughts on on what's going on at St. Anne's at the moment. So, so yeah, obviously, you know, local lad born in Warsaw. Who did you, who was your team growing up? Where did, where did you watch your football? Well, obviously being mixed race, my dad was um, from Jamaica, so I was more cricket than football. Yeah. But my uncles on my mum's side um, all supported Liverpool. Okay. So it was sort of growing up, it was all about Ian Rush and, and Dog Leash and Sooness and all these type of players. So I suppose that was my, um, I would say inspiration, but no, it was more, my dad used to want me to play cricket, but I was never any good. So I was just uh, playing on the local parks with my uncles. And I suppose Liverpool were the, the only team that was talked about in my household. Yeah. Well, a de- decent team to sort of be be brought up with. Yeah, that, that yeah. is for sure. And and so um, you, obviously you, you said your dad very much into cricket. How did you personally get into football? How did that journey start for you? Was it school and then... Then after that, yeah, I think, yeah, I went to um, I went to a school which was uh, predominantly sports related. It was all about sports, and at the time, it was one of those schools where all my mates went to another school because it was closer. So it was just me on my own went to a, a sports school, and um, yeah, I think got into football from that. But obviously, playing in the local parks with my my, um, my mates and my my family would, um, helped me a little bit. But then the school, my senior school, was really good. Um, managed to get into the local town team, the county team. Um, yeah. Me and my mum on the bus going to all these venues and games in the rain and the snow. So, yeah, and then um, I had a, a friend of mine um, sign for Aston Villa, Paul Granger, um, when he was at school and um, in a, a, a local town game against, I think it was uh, Staffordshire County. Um, I got spotted by the Villa Scout and I went down there for a year um, at Aston Park there and but they never took me on, which was fine. Um, yeah. I wasn't really good enough, if I was honest. Um, I wasn't really into football that much like my mates were. So I come out of the game then at 16. I didn't play at all. I, I uh, sort of got into um, a lifestyle, shall we say. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I didn't play football at all. Wow. And then a friend of mine, um, his dad ran a, a local team in, in Warsaw called Afro-Caribbean. So it was all Jamaicans, Rastafarians and... And we played, my first game was against um, Swim Fun Hall, a, a Young Defenders Institute in Litchfield. Jesus. Which was eye opener. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what side of the fence you are, a couple of my mates was already in there. So we played against my mates. So it was, uh, it was a revelation. But yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that period of time, it was just playing for pubs teams on a Sunday and, and, and playing for Afro Caribbean on a Saturday. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, there's a lot of, I think a lot of footballers, certainly of that era, I think did did get sort of picked out of, of sort of football. And, you know, yeah. I don't think it really happens these days. I think the footballs are probably still there, but I think yeah. we're probably a bit more transfixed on, on maybe looking, you know, not really into the non-leagues anymore, which I think is a yeah. shame. So, so obviously you, you started to, to put the boots back on. When, when did you sort of then progress from, I guess maybe a kick about something a bit more serious. Yeah. It, to be fair, it was, a, it was a quick transition because um, then I got spotted for a, a non-league side in, in Walsall, Blockshire Town. Um, the manager then, I think I played about eight, nine games towards the end of the season. And the manager then passed me on to um, uh, a team, Bromsgrove Rovers. He knew the manager, Bobby Hope, who was 
unbelievable for me. I got to be honest, he was he was magic for me. Um, and I went for a trial with Bromsgrove, and um, I was working on the railway at the time, so shifts and things like that it was difficult. And and we played Wolves in a pre-season friendly, and I got to be honest, it was so easy to play. Really? You know, against the Wolves apprentices, if you like, and it was so easy. And I remember um, Bobby pulling me after the game, saying, "Look, we're going to offer you a contract." And I says, "That's fine, as long as I can go out on a Friday after Friday night." I saw my mates were still going out on a Friday night and <laughs> things like that. But you, obviously, you couldn't. So um, that sort of um, knocked him back a bit. Um, and a, a, a friend of mine, his dad, Grenville Palin, who used to play pro for Wolves, sort yeah. of. Um, Bobby phoned him and said, look, I have a word with Martin because he's, he's got something, he's, he's a decent talent. And I sat down with Grenville um, and he sort of said, look, you know, Bobby's saying that you could earn good money at non, non-league level. And I thought, yeah, why not? Um, I was still working for the railway, obviously training Tuesdays and Thursdays, stopping on a Friday and then playing on a Saturday. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I suppose from, from the Afro-Caribbean days to Bromsgrave, it was really pretty quick. The transition, yeah, but you know, back back then, you know, Bromsgrove were a decent side, they had a decent setup, and they did sort of progress. Sort of, yeah, I, I, I can't remember the exact years, but them and sort of Kiddy were sort of vying for yeah. that sort of local. Yeah, I mean, well, that was quite hardcore local rivalry. I mean, I, I used to get down Kiddy on a, on a, I think it was like yeah. a Wednesday or Thursday night, but you know, it, it was good football, it really was. Yeah. And I think some really good players came out of that, to be honest, to sort of later down the line. So you've obviously got your gig with, with Bromsgrove. When did you think that, when do you think there could be more than that? You yeah. know, when did it progress to something you thought, I've got something here? Well, we, one Thursday, um, my, my mind was probably elsewhere because obviously working on the British Rail, it was hard work, as I say, shifts and the work itself. So my mind was probably elsewhere. It wasn't really dominated and, and concentrated and focused on football. And I remember having a, on a Thursday night having to sit down with Bobby and just saying, look, I'm not happy. Um, it's too hard for me. If you yeah. give me Thursdays off, I could play on a Saturday for you. But obviously you couldn't. Um, I, was on, I was under contract and um, he sort of, shall we say, we had a heated conversation. Um, <laughs> and he, uh, he told me if I'm, not gonna make, if I'm not there on Saturday to forget it, you know, kind of thing. And um, I remember um, going to work on a Friday afternoon and coming back uh, and walking my dad into his local pub and sitting down with my dad with his Guinness and his, his whiskey chaser <laughs> and just saying, look, you know, what, what's going on? And he just says, look, you know, you, you know, not, don't really want to work on the railway all your life. Try yeah. football. You might as well give it a go. Um, yeah. I played on the Saturday. Um, and then the following week, um, Bobby pulled me and says there's um, interest from pro clubs. Um, and I went on trial. I went on trial to Cambridge and... Um, I, was, I spoke to Harry Redknapp, who was at Bournemouth at the time. Yeah. Um, I spoke to Derby. I spoke to a few clubs. Um, and Bobby said, look, keep, carry on with your football and the club will sort it out kind of thing. And um, within the first season, um, I did really well, play of the year and blah, blah, blah. And then the second year, for whatever reason, um, you know, when you hit that form and you felt good about your form yeah. and... Um, my weight was coming down and, you know, I was trying to work out all my shifts. So everything was sort of in place. And I was 20, 20 21 at the time. Yeah. Um, and I was more focused on football then. And um, I remember speaking to Steve Coppel at Crystal Palace. Go down for a, it wasn't a trial. It was like, you know, go and see what it's like. And um, I went down to Crystal Palace for four days. Um, I went to Cambridge again for a couple of days. Um Spoke to Harry Rennup again at, at uh, Bournemouth, and I spoke to Bobby one Thursday. And he said, "Look, go where the you know the the best money is, and go where the best deal is." And at the time, Crystal Palace were in the Premier League. Yeah. Um, and I went down and I signed for Crystal Palace. Luckily, the deal was I could come back and help um, Bromsgrove get into the the then uh, the Conference team um, league. Sorry, so yeah, um, was, the deal was done. I signed for Palace, and I come back and played on loan for for Bromsgrove. Wow. So, I mean, to go from, you know, I guess working on the railway to a Premier yeah. League club, that's yeah. an interesting transition. Well, <laughs> I've got to be honest, it, it was obviously living away from home and um, I just bought a house in, in Warsaw as well. So that was strange. But um, when you see all these <clears throat> players, these people, sorry, on the TV, you watch, you know, and then you're actually training with them and seeing them every day. It's weird. Um, I used to travel down with Stan Collymore to Palace. 
um, wow. on a Monday and then come back on a Friday if he wasn't in the first team, which he wasn't. So, um, yeah, he was the transition was fine. Put me in the hotel and all my mates come down for weekends and stuff like that. So he's great. So she was fantastic. But yeah, it was uh, the, the first year. Um, it was pre season was tough because obviously it was a proper professional yeah. pre season. That was tough. Um, and I settled into the reserves. We played some good sides. Um, I remember two footing Ray Parler, who's at Arsenal. He had long hair at the time. And, that, that's a lot, uh, you mate. Well, you know what I mean. And, but to me, growing up, that was the way football was played. Yeah. Physical and competitive and aggressive. And then even back then, you know, he was sort of like frowned upon. And you're thinking, well, what's going on? And then I remember Eric Young um, two footing Chris Coleman in a training training session at Palace. And you're thinking, yeah, I like that. But because <laughs> the, the sent Eric Young off, um, Alan Smith was the manager at the time. He sent him off, and you know, it, it's one of them strange ones. But at the time, I've got to be honest, the ground in I had was fantastic. Jeff Thomas was there, yeah. Gareth Southgate was there. Was um, Ian Wright there at the t- Ian Wright had just gone to Arsenal, so right. yeah, Chris I was say, must have been close. Yeah, yeah. Stan, Stan was there. Stan was unbelievable, unbelievable talent. And we had some good players, Simon Osborne, who liked to play for Wolves, and um, these kind of players. So it was a good squad, but. I found myself playing well for the reserves, but not really getting anywhere near the first team. Yeah. So I went to Grimsby um, to speak to the manager at Grimsby at the time. I forget who it was. He wanted me on loan towards the end of that season. On the way back, I spoke to John Duncan at Chesterfield. Okay. Um, again on loan. And then I got home and there was a, a, a message. My missus was telling me there was a message from Walsall. Perfect. Um, Paul Taylor and, and Kenny Ibbett. So... Spoke to them. Um, they sorted it all out with um, with Crystal Palace, and I finished that season on loan at Walsall. Yeah, and and you know that. How was it? I know you, you sort of grew up maybe as a Liverpool fan, but obviously from from the area, and I guess all yeah. you, all the mates you used to knock around with, and all of a sudden you're now. I mean, I, I was was it carnage? It was absolute <laughs> carnage. Every home game, I'd have a bit. I'd, I'd need about fifty tickets. <laughs> all my mates were all tight. They wouldn't pay for tickets or anything. So <laughs> come on, watch him play. They wanted a free ticket. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was fantastic. I've got to be honest, it was great. Um playing professionally in the first team, you know, you're, you're getting headlines and yeah, um, my, my parents could come and watch, my mates were coming watching. It was great. I mean, it, again, I was 22, 23, maybe, and it was it was normal, you know. And yeah. you go yeah. in, go into the shop and you know, people say, Oh, that's my I'm like, yeah. And what? So it actually didn't dawn on me what I was doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. So you went on to make, I think, from the loan of when you signed over 100 appearances for Warsaw, you know, scored, scored your decent share of goals, which you pretty you did pretty much throughout your, your career. So when that came to, you'd obviously, as you said, you that had been successful. Uh, I think you, Peterborough maybe then came in for you. But what was, what was that sort of evolution, that change, like when Peterborough sort of came in? Yeah, well... Um, again, you know, I was, I was probably mature and I was focused. I was really into my football. It sounds strange, but I was really into my football. Yeah. Um, and there was a quick ch- turnaround in managers at Walsall. Kenny Bitt went and Chris Nickel got in. We, we got promotion. Um, and there was a bit of interest. Um, Derby put a bid in, I think, and then a few other clubs. And But Walsall was stalling on a new contract. Barry, uh, it was a Blues at the time, Barry Fry. We had a fantastic, unbelievable, uh, memorable meeting at, at St Andrews with, with Baz. And, um, you know, he sold the club to me. But unfortunately, the deal he offered me wasn't the deal he told Karen he was going to offer me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it all fell through. Um, and again, Warsaw, you know, I went to Warsaw for a new contract. They didn't offer me a new contract. Um, wanted me to go to Blues. Baz says, look, you know, the deal ain't right, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then Baz got the sack, went to Peterborough, bought Peterborough. Yeah. And in the tribunal, um, we, we went up to, uh, to Blackpool on the tribunal, me and another player, Scotty Oughton. Um, and Baz says, look, and you know what Baz is like, if I get you under £500,000, I've done a great deal. It's fantastic. You know, he's like, and he got, <laughs> a spell for, he, got, he got a spell for 350 grand. And he was cock a hoop. He was overjoyed. You know, he was brilliant. But the chairman and the, and the manager at Warsaw at the time was in the, in the just across the right end, the other room, and they were like distraught, dead. Um, 
So <laughs> you can imagine the atmosphere, the yin and yang of that room. But yeah, I moved to I moved to to, to Peterborough, and on the day I I signed and they sort of un unveiled me, he said he was going to sell me. Baz, no, I'm going to sell you. Yeah, I'm going to sell you. We, he's found a two million pound debt that he didn't know he had at Peterborough or something. <laughs> This is Baz all over. Yeah, well, I was going to say, Baz doesn't strike me as a guy that does due diligence, oh, to be exactly. honest. <laughs> exactly. So, I've just signed for the club, record signing and all that, and he's saying he's going to sell me. So he sort of um, advertised me, if you like, to all the clubs. And um, again, I was in good form, um, playing well for Peter. But I think it was, I went down to speak to Graham soon as it's at, at uh, Southampton. Um uh, yeah, the deal was all right for me, but it wasn't all right for, for Peter because they wanted cash and he was offering players and things. So, And then at the blue, um, Trevor um, come in for me and about some time he's going to meet um, Trevor at, at St Andrews, which I did. Um, and, you know, so I say the rest is history. Yeah. So what, what when you said you were sold on the club when I think when Baz was there, was that... You know, down to to Baz, or was it down to when you I did the whole sort of West Hills and everything else? Did you think, do you know what, this is a decent club, or what? What's you know what? I, I only met Baz in the office at St Andrews, and I can remember him walking me through the the, the tunnel, and just as you come into St Andrews, and it's like, well, obviously being local, you knew all about the Birmingham City. Um, I'd grew up in an era where Zulu were, you know, flying and unbelievable and things like that, so. You knew about the club, um, and for whatever reason, it just felt like, yeah, this is where you want to play football. You know, the, the yeah. next evolution of my career was playing to a big club at the time. And so, um, for me, it, it, if he could have got the deal out of the line, I would have signed for Blues there and then. But, you know, at, at that time, I think he had about 150 players in his squad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it didn't happen. But, yeah, when I spoke to Trevor... Um, you know, I think that summer he'd signed some big names, Steve Bruce and Gary Ablett, Furlong and Mike Newell, Barry Horn. Um, and it was a it was a good squad. Um, so, you know, it was if I if I felt to myself that I need to play on a, on a bigger stage, that was the next stage. And um, when I signed for Blues, it was great. It was, you know, it was it was a, the next step uh, of my career. And um, I had, you know, I had some great times at Birmingham City. And how did you how did you get on with Trev? Because I mean, obviously, is I mean, absolute blues legend. But yeah. I think you know where he was very much uh, you know, an obvious genius on the pitch. Yeah. I think when it came to to management, how did you find him? Was was he you know in relation well, to other managers similar? Or I'll be honest with you. I think for me, obviously, when when a manager buys you, you feel good, didn't you? Because you know you've got yeah. confidence and you trust him, so you, yeah. you are going to yeah. play for him. But I think at the time, the, the backroom staff, Mick Mills, Ian Bowyer, um, Jim Barron, I think was there, Frank Barlow, he had a fantastic backroom staff, all vastly experienced, winners in their own right. Yeah. Um, and for me, Trevor was more man manager um, because from the first day I entered the, the building, probably till the last, he let the players speak, if that made sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I can remember times where, um, you know, off time, he wouldn't come into the dressing room, whether he was playing good or bad, he'd let the players sort, if there's any problems, sort it out themselves, which showed character and it showed, for me, good man management skills. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I got on with Trevor. Yes, we've had our fallouts and he'll tell you probably, he'll tell you some of the fallouts we've had, but um, I think, yeah, I, all the managers I've played with, it, I, I wouldn't, you know, disrespect him and say he was he wasn't this or he wasn't that. I, like you say, he was a fantastic player for the club, yeah. and he he sort of instilled in me anyway what it was like to play for Birmingham City, if that made sense. Yeah. So you had that sort of affinity to the club. Sure, and and just you mentioned the players that came in in, in that era, which was you know certainly early days of of Sullivan, Gold, and, and Brady. You know, new new ground, everything was absolutely on the upward curve. Uh, after probably ten years of just well, yeah, it was a mess, mm. and and the the players that they brought in, including yourself, I mean, there are some serious leaders in that in that group, and and you know, I, I guess it's no surprise that for the time that you were at Blues, you know, we were always knocking the door. So how how did the, the dynamic work with so many, I guess, alphas in that in that one space? Yeah, I think 
obviously out of respect for the names I mentioned, you know, we, we had um, Steve Bruce who led by example, um, not on the training ground, but in on matches on Saturday, he'd ref game, he'd ref games. Um, so you you know, you then when he left, Gary Abbott took his position and filled his shoes, and Gary was more quiet. Abs was a fantastic professional, made you do everything properly, um, was a good leader. Although he, he probably wouldn't think he was, he was, he was, he was br brilliant. And then sort of um, he came into my realm. Well, yeah. I've always been a bit mouthy and a bit trappy and like to say my point. So I suppose that the, the next, the next sort of leader was was me. But we had Michael Johnson, we had Martin Granger. Um, Tatey was just going and Debs was still there and um, Fur, Furs was a bit quiet for long. Barry Orn was going and Mike Newell was a bit um, erratic, shall we say. So <laughs> the sort of alpha male was always there, but it was it was backed up, supported by other, yeah. not lesser alpha males, but other guys who wanted the best for themselves and, and the club. Yeah. And just just on, on I guess, the, the ongoing playoff semi-finals... <laughs> How I mean, as as a player and as a skipper, I mean, what are your memories of those? And and does one in particular stand out over the others, where you were sort of, you know, it was really gut wrenching? Yeah, the Watford one is probably the most hurtful, in my opinion. Um, we were so close, did really well down there, and come back, took it to penalties. I wouldn't say I mean we, I don't we've ever bottled penalty situations, but it just wasn't for us, you know. Yeah. And then to, to, to go again the next year, it was always difficult, but we did it. Yeah. You now when you get there, and I think it was Barnsley, didn't play yeah. at all, didn't, didn't perform at all at St Andrews, got done easily. Um, and I remember Trevor not seeing us for like two or three days in between the games and we just training on our own. And I remember having a meeting with the boy saying, look, you can't finish the season after all them games and efforts, you know, on St Andrews' performance. We've got to go out and and put a performance in against Barnsley at Barnsley, even though, you know, the odds were stacked against us, yeah. which we did, which we did, but obviously it wasn't to be. And then the Preston debacle. Um, again, you know, it's it's memories that you you want to not forget, but you, to go again that season and get in the playoffs again. Yeah. Um, we're knocking on the all the time and we just couldn't get out of the line. I think if we'd have gone out of the line in the semi-finals, we'd have won, gone on to win. The yeah. final going to the Premier League, but it was never to be. No, and, and just just on on penalties and and you know I said I think taking it that extra extra step, then obviously the the League Cup run, which obviously uh, was just unbelievable. I mean, the one thing that's come out from speaking to a lot of the the players in, involved in and around that time was the semi final um, at Blues. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to be there. And it was just, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've never seen anything like it. How was he to play in that? I've said many a time, John, that um, that that game, I never used to get nervous before games, any games. Never used to get nervous. I was really chilled. I was I was calm. But I remember going in the, in the, in the uh, tunnel, leading the boys out, and we had to wait for the referees and the opposition, Ipswich, to come out. And the, 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 the ground was rocking. You know, honestly, under the railway, it was absolute. You could see the mo the bricks moving, and it was frightening. <laughs> and I remember going out, walking out, and just you could feel it. The noise, you could actually, you could hear it, but you could feel it, and you're like, "Wow, this is football." Yeah. You know, and we had a little bit of a, a team talk um, before, but after the woman went back in, and we said, "Look, you know, there's like twenty five thousand people wanting you to do. We've got to do it." Yeah. I think we were one nil down at the time. I think the first leg we lost one nil, um, and we just believed. You know, Trevor made a fantastic um, meeting, uh, uh, and it was it, you just felt like we've got to do it because we can't let these people down again, kind of yeah. thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it speaks for itself that the rest of the game it was uh, it was unbelievable, unbelievable. And then, obviously, moving on to into the final, what 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 are your recollections of of the day? And I guess, from a personal point of view, it doesn't get better than that, does it? Surely, and it's no. only again against Liverpool, which you didn't know. So there was that yeah. that link as well. I think after the, the the we beat Ipswich, it was a bit calm. Then the club was a bit calm, and um, we knew we'd, we'd made it, and we wanted to get our league form better. And 
But we, you know, we, we was having reports. You'd, you'd look on Elio Fogan on that Saturday and Gerard had scored two and Owen had scored one and Fowler had scored one and Eskin, you're thinking, wow, OK. But, you know, the build-up, we went away for two or three days, stopped in Wales, <clears throat> trained, um, went to see the... the uh, it was amazing because the day before the game, we went to see the actual Millennium Stadium and we're doing all the, the bits and pieces. The, the roof was closed. And, you know, we had one of these um, these buzzies that wasn't, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't the top, top coach yeah. that we had. And as we were pulling out, we saw the Liverpool bus pulling and it was double decker and <laughs> all bling, bling. And you're thinking, wow, okay. And you see Robbie Fowler come out the bus and all these players, Gary McKay's to come out and they just, you know, the, the look, the, and you're thinking, well, we've got to play these tomorrow. But, um, yeah, the Friday we had a good meal and it was really quiet. Because normally we, we had Ian Bennett and we had some people who would just make everybody laugh. And but the evening before it was really quiet and um driving down to to, to the game on, on the day it was just red and blue everywhere. Yeah. It was it was an amazing sight, you know, it was an amazing sight. And uh, when we actually walked onto the pitch, we had you know the usual suits and all that, and you, it was just taking it all in. And you, I remember Trevor saying, you know, if you want to be a top player, you get these moments all the time. Yeah. It might be the first and only time some of us would ever get into this position. So you've got to enjoy it. And, um, you know, the game first half, we were nowhere near, if I'm being honest, didn't really lay a glove on, on Liverpool. Great goal from Fowler. But second half, again, more belief. Um, and, yeah, we took them to penalties. And from, my, from, from where I am, you know, he should have given a penalty. I'm not going to say his name. I am not saying his name. <laughs> he should have given a second penalty. I was going to ask you how yeah. you felt about that. <laughs> oh, no, don't please, because I can't swear. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it was a fantastic experience. I've got to be honest, probably the best of my football career. Yeah, uh, and I, and I think that again, I, man, I managed to get in it. I won't, it was an interesting journey. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the foul goal was unbelievable. But after that, we just seemed to I don't know, like a like you said, a sort of a light turned on. Yeah. And we were absolutely exceptional. And again, again, it was a bit like, you know, when we later, later down the line, we played Arsenal in the cup final. They were a serious yeah. team. Yeah. Um, and he did, you know, the ref, he asked it, you know, I, yeah. I think if that's, if that isn't blues, it's given. It's as simple as that. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and and I, told, uh, I told him so in no, no uncertain terms after the game. <laughs> well, he couldn't send me off then. He couldn't send me off, so he was all right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean again, a, a massive highlight. And then, we get we go into the next season, and obviously your career with Blue sort of uh, that that's it. So how how did you feel? I guess when it sort of I think you moved on in in the February. Yeah. Where was that just a mutual thing, or where where was your head at with that? Um, well, I've, Steve come in um, as manager, um, and you know yourself sometimes. Obviously, manager's got different opinions of your sets different opinions and yeah. new ideas and things like that. And um, I, I felt like I wasn't in his plans, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, a couple of times he, he dropped me and stuff. So I've always wanted to play. I've never been a sub, if I'm yeah. being honest. Never, I don't, never liked being on the bench. Not like some players nowadays, but do you know what I mean? And I, I remember having it out with him after one game and um, probably looking back hindsight, I was probably out disrespectful. Yep. In the way I approached him and the way I put myself across. Um, and on the Monday, he says, look, you know, um, he's thought about it. He's going to let me go, which was fine. Um, we were both men, both grown up. So you take it on the chin and, and you move on. I knew that I hadn't um, let the club down in the time I'd been there. So I'll move on with a, mm. with a, with a, um, a fresh step and, and move on to new challenges. And unfortunately, there was a few clubs at the time, um, Preston, I think, uh, Norwich, who came in for me, but because they were um, vying for playoffs and, and things like the top of the championship, he didn't want me to, to go to these competitors, if you like. Yeah. Which yeah. sort of, uh, yeah, it's sort of, um, I wasn't happy, shall we say. And yeah. I, I brought my opinion, I told him, you know, I, I, I told him that I didn't deserve to be treated like that. I want to move on. And um, But he, it, to be fair to Steve, he stuck by his guns and, um, we, we trained, he, he had me with reserves and I'm not, if you know me, I'm not one of those, you know, to, to spit my dummy out and <clears throat> kick doors and that most of the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, 
did my best. And Colin Lee had just take, taken over at Walsall. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> we were bottom of the championship. So, you know, I've gone from being captain of Birmingham City, we're knocking on the door every season to speaking to somebody, all right, yeah, my local club, but bottom of the championship, who was cast adrift, I think three points adrift or something. Yeah. And again, you know, you, you, you speak to, I spoke to Colin and the chairman at Warsaw and they sold it to me, you know, a new challenge. You can sort of be the hero if we stay up and blah, blah, blah. And um, it was something that I wanted to do to carry on playing. I didn't want to go to any other club and be on the bench or be, you know, a, not a bit player. Yeah. And he said he'd play me every week. I wanted to play every week because I still felt I could play every week in the championship. I wanted to prove, if I'm being honest, prove Steve wrong that I could still play in the championship and, and yeah. worthwhile and be a positive influence, which luckily for us, um, that season we stayed up. So um, as as Blues beat Norwich in the playoff final, I was watching it in the Iron Apple um, bar, absolutely off me, off me head on alcohol. But it was a great because we'd stayed up, Blues had gone up. What more do you want? Yeah. Um, just last, <laughs> just lastly on your time at Blues, um, this question comes from my nan, by the way, right. um, and she really wanted me to ask it. So uh, she said, is it true that when we played Wolves, Kevin Muscat bit you, but you got sent off? Yeah. Um, it, it didn't bite me, but I did get sent off. Yeah, I, um, I punched him in the face. Um, <laughs> But before that, if I'm being honest, um, he, he'd put in the papers all that week um, that we didn't have any good players and, and it wasn't a good team. And um, it sort of wrangled me, if I'm honest, because you don't disrespect other players and other clubs. You don't do it. Um, there's ways of putting things. And he, he was blatantly saying we were, we were rubbish and we wasn't very good and they're going to beat us and all the usual. And I remember on a Friday, me and Martin Granger having a bet Who's going to do him first? Who's going to, you know, <laughs> him first? And him being um, a right back and Grange being a left back, obviously the odds were against, were against me being central midfield, but you thought Grange got more of a chance. So we had a bet. Um, and I think it was like 85th, 86th minute, and nobody, Grange or myself, had got near him. Um, and I remember, him, I remember walking off at half time, giving him a few verbals. So I'm going to get you and all that. But to be fair to, to, to Muscat, he was fine. He was all right about it. And 85 minutes in and I'm thinking, right, OK, so the ball gets played and I've, I've gone on to it. And he's sort of like, at the time, we had collars on our shirts and he's like pulling my collar. So I thought, better time. I'm never going to do it again. I'm never going to the position. So I just went around and just gave him a right-hander. And obviously, <laughs> uh, that was it. Red card, I'm off. And luckily, we won the game, but... Um, I got fined two weeks' wages for a red card, and Grange never paid the bet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> never paid the bet. That's brilliant. Right. And, uh, you know, and I, th I think that, I mean, Muscat was a, I mean, I remember seeing um, Walter, I think, uh, somewhere where Warnock was, and Muscat had been at it all game. Yeah. All yeah. Game. And how he hasn't been filled in, literally, I mean, very, very badly because he was a little story. John, there's a little story. Some of the Wolves players, I didn't know this, um, but um, Steve Corrick, when I, when I went to Walsall, told me the story that we was in uh, in a bar in Blues in Birmingham. Uh, some of the Walsall players were in the bar in Birmingham and um, some of the Wolves players must have come in. I didn't see them. Um, and Kevin Musket come in and someone, one of the Wolves players had said, oh, Martin O'Connor's the, by the bar. Obviously, after this event and all that. And apparently, Kevin Musket and a few other players walked out Walked out the bar, and I never knew that until Steve Coke had told me. So, uh, yeah, I can I can honestly say I think I've had a, an effect on his life. I think been... <laughs> living in his head rent free. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're up there. Yeah, yeah. So Brilliant. after I guess your playing days and moved into management, what what was, is that something you'd always wanted to do, or, or is that something that when you were playing you thought, well, obviously as a leader, this yeah. feels like it's a natural progression, or how did that play out? The, the leader leader tag has stuck. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know why, but because I've always wanted to win and I've always wanted to, you know, to, to not be beaten. I've always wanted to compete. So I, I do get it, but the leader tag. So when you go into management, you find that you have to be a little bit more um, patient, if you like, and a little yeah. bit more different. You have to be different. And the management side, I managed at non-league, which was easy. 
and then coming to, to, to Walsall, um, and I realised that the recruitment process is vital at any club, um, down in the big club or the small clubs, and we didn't recruit properly. So our, our tenure as, as assistant manager didn't, my tenure, tenure as assistant manager didn't last. Mm. So, of course, you know, you, you sort of come away from it. And I did have some time out of the game, which I think everyone needs. You know, if, you, if you're at it every day for any years, you, you need to come away from it. Uh, so rather than drive trains again, the next, you know, step was going to coaching. So I got on my badges and things like that. So I think it's sort of like a natural progression if that's the way your mindset is and what, you know, what you enjoy and what, you, what your interests are. So uh, uh, probably a really good segue that there could be a job available. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. Right. We're going there, are we? Okay. We're, well, I'll tell you, we're going, we're going two footed straight in, okay. mate. <laughs> so, um, yeah, j- just, just your thoughts on, I guess, not necessarily what we'll talk about now, but... I think there's a fair bit of maybe after timing when it comes to Karanka where I don't, I didn't hear many blues fans or your ex players, whatever saying that, that he was not going to be a good appointment. I think we're all in agreement that, you know, we pretty much, he was ticking a box. We knew what we were going to get. He was going to get a bit of support. So what were your thoughts when he was signed and, and how do you think it's, it's gone and how, how are we now in the position we're in? John, I'm quite, I'm saying vocal social media. I'm quite vocal on this because I think before he joined, for me, Blues potentially is a fantastic club, a big club. I think it's lost its way over the years, in my opinion. Mm. You know, when you look at Birmingham City, in my opinion, they shouldn't be fighting relegation. Don't know who's in charge. No. You know, I, don't, I, I honestly believe that. I, I know the rivalry between Villa and that, but I think Villa are, are on a different level now to us. Yeah. And you have to understand that. Blues, I think the way... <laughs> His predecessors, Karanka's predecessors, haven't really had much time. And then you look back at the managers we've had, you know, good or bad, yeah. but there's too many. Yeah. There's too many in the history of Birmingham City to, to have any consistency, to have any stability, to build on a foundation. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, was, it was always a tough job. It was always going to be a tough job because of the history before he took the, the position on. So um, you look at his, his CV, he did well at Middlesbrough. He had a, you know, an iffy time at Forest, in my opinion. Yeah. And when you're bringing in a, a, a manager, a coach, who whose philosophy, in my opinion, was different to his predecessor, yeah. you're always going to have trouble. And it's always going to take time. Yeah. But I think, you know, we look at it now, and um, I think we're in trouble, if I'm yeah, being honest. I, I, I think we're so. in trouble. I think, and not because of the manager, I think it's because the the nature of the players we've got, I yeah. don't see much fight in them. No. And when you when you look at for me, when you look at Birmingham City, and I said this to I said this to Martin Grange the other week, um, you have to people believe that when you play Birmingham City, it's going to be a tough game. Yeah. At the moment, it's not. No. It's not tough to play Birmingham City. Yes, I get the fact that there's no fans, and I, I truly believe because I'm, I'm I'm scouting there for a championship. I truly believe that some players are quite happy playing with no fans. Yeah. And I believe that some managers are quite happy playing with our fans. Can you imagine some of the performances no. Blues have put in? And, you know, on a Tuesday night, on a Saturday afternoon, the fans wouldn't have it. They but wouldn't they, have they, it. They'd have ripped the ground to pieces. Yeah. And there you go. So I think they've got away with it so far. And it's just how do you, how do you draw the line? How do you make Birmingham City better? And I think it's going to take time. It's going to take years. Because yeah. I don't think that the club that, with the greatest respect, most fans think they are. No, no, and I think you make a, a really good point that you know, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we're sort of speaking in this great speaking to a lot of, of ex ex players from various sort of, I guess, I guess eras, if you like. But I think for for yourself, apart from the end with Brucey, I mean, you only played under one manager and you were there for six years. That's unheard yeah. of, literally yeah. unheard of. Yeah. And and I think that if you then sort of forward wind to the point where you know, post McLeish, then you know. We've been through that many managers and we'd had the blueprint. And I think that whether we like it or not, the the the, the Golds and the Sullivans and the Bradys of this world, it's, you know, be, be careful what you wish for. Um, and, and, I, and I think that was the the beginning of, of not the end, but but this, yeah. this difficult position we find ourselves in. Yeah. And, and, and I think with with Karanka and, and 
to give him maybe a little bit of leeway, and I would hundred percent agree with you. And you, you know, you rolled off some players when you were playing. You know, how many Ablets are there? How many O'Connors are there? How many Bruces are there? You know, how many? Just every. I mean, Devlin was a pain in the. I mean, nasty little fucker. I mean, you know, it, they're not there. You know what though, John? The thing about it is, I've watched Blues, and technically they are good. You yeah. know, the, te- the technical um, levels of the players are good, but it's just that that aggression that competitive that um character that's yeah, what i need to win exactly exactly tom that's what you need and you know being in that position at times you could see and, and this is going to sound where you could see sometimes before games especially on a tuesday night on a saturday afternoon when it's full it's rocking the opposition didn't really like it it was uncomfortable yeah now you know it, even when the fans were back you know lee clark days and these kind of times, you're thinking, well, it's Steve Cottrell days. It's the players for me ain't Birmingham City players to get them out of the position they're in now. And you're sort of building on, uh, not I wouldn't, I wouldn't say rubble because that's disrespectful. You're building on uneven ground and you're always going to have that rocky period. And I think this is where the last three or four years where Blues have been fighting off relegation. You can't, in my opinion, you can't class Birmingham City as a big club if you're fighting off relegation season upon season upon season. No. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I think that the, 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 I think the frustration that we all have is that, yes, we've been fighting relegation for so many seasons now, but the same players keep getting the shirts. And you're like, well, I, I, I don't have to square that circle because it, it doesn't make any sense. And we've now got players that will come in. And I'm, I'm happy. I mean, I, I know you, as, a, as an ex pro, out of respect, but I'm not an ex player and I'm a fan and I've been. <clears throat> you know, living this for a long time. And how Harley Dean gets his shirt, I just never know. I just John, don't know. I'm on the camp now. It's going to go against probably everybody in the who, who follows football, but I'm against rotation. I'm against it because I honestly think from, from a Saturday, you put in a performance to make the manager not drop you. Yeah. And I think you train to make the manager want to play you in that Saturday. So if you've got all those elements in your squad, You've got a you've got a you've got a good chance of, of getting a performance on a Saturday. Now, I'm not for rotation. I know they say tired legs and tired minds. I'm not having that because no. players are fitter than yeah. they've ever been. Yeah. Mentally, they might be a bit weaker, in my opinion. Yeah. Mentally, but I think physically they've, they've been fitter than any. So you can play Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. You can do that if you're a good player and you want to be in the game. If you've you know if you've played well on a Saturday and then the manager drops you for the Tuesday, yes, you're going to have there's going to be fireworks. And I'm not saying for one minute that, you know, I remember uh, at my time and Trevor dropped me, I think it was Sheffield United. And I went in raging. And to be fair, I kicked the door and I found out I wasn't playing and I, I blew off and I was going mad because I wanted to play against Sheffield United. Um, and Trevor in his own way, waited for me to calm down, uh, <laughs> the doors back on the hinges um, you know, <laughs> put his plows back on their pegs and said look Mark if you play against Sheffield United and you get booked you won't play against Liverpool I went right. okay and then Gaffer walked out yeah. because you know you, but nowadays I don't I don't see players wanting to play every week No. and it makes it no. easy for, for managers then to do rotation well he ain't not he's off it we'll play him and and this is where sort of the Karanka um, philosophy of rotating players and there's certain players, when you see that team sheet on a Saturday or Tuesday evening, you're thinking, hey, has he got a shirt? Yeah. You know, so... Yeah. yeah I think and, 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 you know, the, the, it's, I don't think it's any coincidence. The last sort of settled period we had was probably under Rowett. And Never you could pick the team. Yeah, yeah, and he mm-hmm. played them every single week, didn't he? He didn't really yeah. rotate. I mean, he didn't, have, he didn't have any players, exactly. did he? he exactly. He'd never play him. He kept the same squad. And I think that was good because everyone was on a good level of understanding and that chemistry was there. Yeah. But also, Thomas, when you're playing well, the way I see it is, you know you're going to be in the team. Whereas yeah. at the moment, if you're playing well, you don't know if you're going to be in the team. So your mindset's a bit different. Yeah. And yeah. the way players are at the moment, and they have been for a couple of seasons now, I think you need to reassure them and trust them to do a job. Now, you can have a bad game, we know that, but mm. I think generally, if, the, if you trust the players, you buy them, you bring them to your club and you're going to play them, play them. Yeah. You know, go and play them. Yeah. The last game I watched the Blues was Wickham at home. First half, dominant, 1-0. Second half, absolutely shocking. Yeah. Now, yeah. 
in my day, the dressing room would have gone off, death without question, at second half performance. But then you you see the nature of the players we've got, and not just at Birmingham, by the way. Yeah. There's, most, you know, championship, there's some poor players mentally, and, and to, to actually go home knowing that you've just put that performance in would, for me, would wrangle me and you'd try and do better in training to make sure you, you get up to speed for the game, the next game. Definitely. Uh, yeah. and I, go on, Tom, if you've got a question. I, I was just going to say, I think what's frustrating, and, you know, me and John have spoke about this so many times, is the teams in and around us, like, you know, Rotherham, for example, yeah. have fight and battle. They may not yeah. have the quality but they're, they're giving their all every week. And I think, you know, at Blues, we've always had that culture of so long as you give 100%, yeah. you, you'll get on well with the fans despite the results. Um, obviously, that's an added frustration, but we're just not seeing that drive but and you, desire. You say that, though, Thomas, the, the culture. What is Birmingham City's culture? What is Birmingham City's philosophy? For me, it's been hard working. Be aggressive, be competitive, put a shift in. I don't really see that anymore. No, no. You know, I, I mean, I, I, if if I'm looking at that, if I'm looking at the team, I think George Friend's been a revelation. I, I, I he's a, for me a, a real throwback blues player. I said it a few weeks ago on a pod, and, and he's the armband would be on him straight away. Yeah. Um, I like Gary Gardner because I think he gets it. Um, yeah. and if Juki could just find his shooting boots, then I think we've got a striker there. And yeah. Hogan's got his, his, I think he's just got his head on it now. But outside of that, yeah, we've got some flair players, but they need to be really corralled into a performance. You need that yeah. sort of every man that's sort of on that pitch, yeah. making sure Sanchez isn't lightweight and making sure Bella is going to get his quality going and, and all that. And you don't see it. You've got the players, but I just don't think we've got the the the, 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 the leaders and the and the influencers to really make it work. But, but John, if it's not coming from off on the pitch, it's got to come from off the pitch. Yeah, and Karanka's not one of those to shout and point and be aggressive. So yeah. you're not getting it from the, your teammates because they're too scared to say anything to you. We, we've had, I've had Darren Purse around the throat. I've had me and Martin Granger's gone face to face, nose to nose. So again, you know, going throw throw back to our days, but those kind of players get you through games, in my opinion. Yeah. When the bullets are flying, you know, and you want to put your head above. There's not many players who do that, and when you're in a relegation fight, you need that, definitely. You can have the flair, all the flair in the world, but you need that heart and you need that battling qualities. And when you look, like Thomas says, Rotherham, look at Sheffield Wednesday. They, they had 12 points deducted and they're above us now. Yeah. yeah. And that's got to, you know, the red flags have got to be flying if that's the case. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that um, as we go into the, the next set of games, I mean... We were briefly talking to Tatey about this yesterday, and and <clears throat> formation wise, Martin, just because I, I. But you know what? It it, it seems like the, in this, and I, I sound like an old man now. In this day day and age, it's like sacrilege to say just make it simple, just go four four two, see what happens. Yeah. Uh, where, where are you? We think something like I, that. I think you can get blindfolded <laughs> by formations, and all that. The intricacies of, of culture now and all the, the patterns of play. And I honestly think that blues are, are quite one paced. Yeah. And I honestly think yeah. they're easy to play against. And you know, to, to, to go on the sort of buzzwords at the moment, you can play in between lines and the lead you spake, blah, blah, blah. But 442, this is what I want you to do, left back. This is what I want you to do, centre midfield. This is what I want you to do, wide right. I don't want you to do anything else but this. When we've got the ball, do this. Yeah. When we haven't got the ball, do that. That's it. Yeah. You know, you don't have to yeah. blind people with science and all these shapes and patterns on the pitch. Defenders, head it and kick it and stop the ball going in the back of the net. Midfield players, stop the midfield players playing and get second balls and, and pass forward. I, yeah. Honestly, for me to watch a midfield player pass forward is like, wow, it's like, you know, I'm still another baby. It's yeah. amazing because I want to play yeah. square and strikers. Um, you know, it's, you, you can get tied down and bogged down with the way football is now, but just go out and be competitive, you know. If I just think that, and, and you definitely, you know, you did it and, and other players in and around the midfield, 
it's just, and I was saying to the lads a couple of weeks ago, we just, we're never receiving the ball on the half turn. We're always facing our own goal. Yeah. So there's only two things you can do. Yeah. Number one is going to be pass it from where it came from. Yeah. Or you might just about get away with it passing it sideways. Yeah. But one thing you can't do is pass it forward because you, you're just going to get shut down. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And and it's I don't, I mean, I think that and if Halalovic is fit, I, and I've, I've said this on the pod before, you just say, right, do what you want. Just yeah. go and get the ball off the centre half yeah. and just build the play. Just yeah. do something different because yeah. at the moment Tunic can't do it. No, how, how we got rid of Kifton Bell? I mean, it might blow my brains out for that decision. The, I mean, the one we, battler the, we had. <laughs> yeah, but but you know what, Thomas? Happened. When you look at again, you can look at philosophy. David Davis, combative. Yeah, you yeah. know, and in the engine room, Kifton Bell in the engine room, and you get rid of those type of players for whatever reason. For whatever reason. You sort of lose that little bit of edge you've got. So, like yeah. you say, the players to go and replace them ain't the type of players that you want when you're in the position we're in. If yeah. that makes sense, yeah, you know? absolutely, absolutely. Definitely. So, just um, mindful that we, we've taken a lot of time, and it's been absolutely fantastic to no catch problem, up with you, Martin. Loved it. Yeah. And what, what we what we tend to do, sort of, as a last a last question, and having having you know you you played in some really really good teams, and for me personally, that that period was. It was lovely to go to St Andrews and expect to to see the side win and play some good football and just get involved. It was it was a really good period of time for the club. Given what you're watching at the moment, um, which one player would you take from the time that you've spent at Blues, where you'd say right, Other than he yourself. would he he would yeah, <laughs> I'd take I'd take I'd take you today, Martin. To be fair, <laughs> um, but who who would have the most influence on the team that would hopefully solve the issues we, we, we have who, who would you who would you say that would be um I think when you look at blues they need um guided they need leadership um and you know in, back in my day um I think a Steve Bruce type who would affect everybody on the pitch even the opposition even the referee yeah um you know that type of leader who knew the game, who wanted to win, who, were, who was desperate not to lose, um, who hated losing, that type of character and ability. I think that's what Blues, you know, for all the flair and um, technically good, able players, we haven't got that leadership in there. So I would probably say, as the players I've played with, and I've played with some really good, you know, not fantastically a bit able players, but just... You'd want them in the trenches. Yeah. Ranger, yeah. Michael Johnson, Debs, um, Horse, the Horse. Um, you know, there's probably what I've seen of, of Blues at the moment. I, I think you've been a bit stingy with just the one player. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think probably, yeah, a leader. So probably Steve Bruce, I'd, I'd probably take. Yeah. But we, we, we tr we're trying to build a team. So we're <laughs> oh, getting okay. good. Yeah. He's looking all right, mate, to be honest. Okay. He's okay. looking all right. If the job okay. comes available, please feel free to apply. <laughs> yeah. Cheers, Thomas. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Um, so, right. so on that note, Martin, thank, thank you very much. It's been an absolute joy, and, and I'm sure that um, all the Blues fans that listen to this will, will, you know, that's just been a really good insight into, you know, who my, Martin O'Connor is and, and all the work that you've done for the club. And, you know, that, that period of captaincy was, uh, as I said, was a joy for us. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, right, well, that, that's, that's cheers, mate. So, right, that's it for another... Uh, pod thanks to uh, Martin and Tom uh, we'll be back very shortly with a, a review of the forthcoming fixtures and uh, again a lot more special guests to come so please subscribe at www.bluefocuspod.co.uk and if you're downloading on Apple iTunes then please leave a comment and rate it it helps us a lot but between now and then thanks very much and keep right on